Until LHON enters our lives, we usually don't know a lot about vision and vision tests. We're familiar with the chart with the big E and lots of other letters below it. In the US, we know that 2020 vision is normal and we've heard of being nearsighted or farsighted. But when LHON enters our lives, we're suddenly immersed in a world filled with terms we may not really understand that are very important to us. Central vision, peripheral vision, scotomas and visual field tests, optic nerves, optic nerve fibers, and OCT testing. People who aren't affected always want to know what those affected see and don't see. Those who are just becoming affected want to know what the future is likely to hold in terms of how much vision they'll lose and retain. Carriers want to know what to expect if they experience onset. So in this talk, Dr. Cronge and I will discuss some of these topics and hopefully provide some background that will make you more informed at your next visit with a doctor for LHON. So the first issue is central vision and peripheral vision. So the way I understand it, and I hope King Dr. Kronja will sort of step in and elaborate and correct as we go along here. Central vision captures fine details, and it's used for reading, identifying faces, driving, etc. Sounds like what we lose with LHON, right? And peripheral vision is weak at distinguishing detail. So with LHON, the central vision um, is affected. It leaves more or less peripheral vision as the disease progresses, I think, from the center out. Um, and also, aging um, causes a normal loss of peripheral vision, so the size of our visual field decreases approximately one to three degrees per decade of life, which I've heard may explain why people expect, um, affected at an older age may have less peripheral vision than those affected at a younger age, uh, since they've already lost some of their far peripheral vision. Uh, and it also might help explain why people might sense that their vision um, has gotten worse as they've aged. Maybe it's the cumulative impact of aging's decreased peripheral vision suddenly being perceived. Is that basically on the right Agreed. track? Agreed. And the one thing that you have to remember is just because you have labus doesn't mean you can't get something else. So if you have some patients who have had, uh, who are affected by labus, for example, and they have damage to their optic nerve, Patients usually have a loss of optic nerve fun fibers. Everybody has a loss of no optic nerve fibers as we grow older. And if that happens too quickly, we call it glaucoma. Now, if you've got a weak optic nerve, chances of you getting affected by pressures that would otherwise be normal go up because the nerve itself is weak to start with. So it's important to keep things like that in mind. And that's part of the reason to continue to follow with your ophthalmologist just to make sure that things are okay from other perspectives. We don't expect things to change rapidly in patients who are affected by labels. But if they are, it's important to look and see that nothing else is going on. Okay. Um, I'm often trying to help people understand what I mean when I say that central vision is lost, uh, that peripheral vision can never be as effective as the lost central vision, um, and that peripheral vision at its best can never be the 2020 vision that central vision can be. Um, and I saw this chart, and I don't know if this is helpful or not. For me as a layperson, I thought it was pretty helpful. What's on the chart has really small letters in the center, and it has large letters around the outside. It's kind of like your typical eye chart, uh, where the big letters are on top and the small letters are on the bottom, but it's putting the small letters in the middle and the big ones on the outside, and it, it seemed to capture what I've heard people say, which is sort of, you know, the middle is where you see the small detail, and out here, the best you can do is the big letters. Is that generally yeah, helpful? absolutely. And one of the ways to think about it is, how many of you have a smartphone? A smartphone. <laughs> do you remember when we used to have flip phones that had cameras? Do you remember the quality of the picture that you used to get from a flip phone? That's kind of like what you get on the periphery because the sensor is not as effective as the sensor in the middle, okay? So your modern camera phone, it's got a very sensitive 4K, whatever it happens to be, sensor, and that is able to give you fine detail. And then if you have a look at the periphery, it's much weaker. So no matter what you do, it's not going to be able to replace the center. Okay. So, 
What's on the um, slide now is the typical eye chart that we all kind of grow up with when we see the eye doctor, and it's called the Snellen eye chart. And someone with normal vision can read the eighth line clearly without glasses or contacts. And in the US, it's called 2020 vision. From 20 feet away, you see what someone with normal vision can see from 20 feet away. If you can read just the top line, the big E, that's 2200 vision, meaning that at 20 feet, you see the big E the way someone with normal vision would see it at 200 feet. If you can't read the big E and your vision is worse than 2200, you're considered legally blind in the US. People affected by LHON usually become legally blind and worse within the first few months of onset of vision loss. The same chart format can be used to measure vision from a different distance on a low vision chart up to 2800. If you can't see any letters on the low vision chart, then you're considered to be off chart and the tester starts holding up fingers um, from gradually closer distances and the results are CF, count fingers, at some number of feet. If you can't count any fingers, um, but you can see hand motion, then that's what's recorded. Um, if you can just get light perception, you're recorded that way. NLP, no light perception. These are very rare with LHON, but for some individuals, you might find that uh, recorded or talked about at your, um, at your doctor's visit, and that's, that's why I'm talking about it here, so you've heard it here first and you understand where it's coming from. And one other note is that if you're talking on Facebook with friends from other countries, it'll get confusing, because they'll talk about normal vision as 6-6 six, six rather than 2020, and legal, vis uh, legal blindness, they, they're calling it 660 rather than 2200, so it gets confusing when you're talking to people, but that's, it's the same thing, just converted. Yeah, so um, it's the adaptation of the metric system. So six six is six. Uh, it's being able to see something at six meters. Twenty twenty is twenty feet, and that's basically the, the main difference. Some places will also use decimal acuity, which is basically taking that ratio and dividing it and getting a number. So one point zero is normal vision. Now, if um, I've got up on the uh, slide now something else called an ETDRS chart, and it's more accurate than a Snellen chart. Um, and it has the same um, the num same number of letters on each line um, with comparable spacing. There's five letters per line. And actually, in an uh, earlier part of the talk this morning, Dr. Kronja was referencing um, the number of letters uh, in one of the trials. And, and that's where they're, they're counting the number of letters um, and I'm seeing head to nod from people who are in trials in the room. You know, if you're used to the Snellen charts, then you're not used to, you're hearing 20, you're used to 2020, and what's this letters on a chart they're talking about? So this is a different format that's helpful in research because instead of having like one big E on the top and, you know, different numbers of letters down the, the chart, every line has the same number of letters. They're all five, so you can get partials and they can compare. Um, and so normal vision on an ETDRS chart is 20 lines or 100 letters. Legal blindness is 10 lines or 50 letters. And again, when they're talking about improvements by number of letters, five is a line. Am I Correct. on track? Yeah. Okay. You want to come lecture my uh, residence? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I just know I, I bring my back up. Um, and then I've put up on the slide, uh, uh, um, on the slide, there's a, a uh, chart that's probably hard to see, but I keep looking for it on, um, on the internet or I could send it to anyone who's in interested. But this is what Dr. Kranja mentioned to earlier about how um, there's also decimal and logmar. And so if you're ever doing, um, if you're reading results from different um, studies, you know, you'll find one person, one study is, is recording things as 1.6, 1.8. I'm like, what are they talking about? And how does that compare to the number of letters? And how does that compare to the 2020? And, and so you find a chart like this online or you ask me for it and you go, okay, this is, this is, this. And is there a better add-on to that? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. There are thankfully some computer programs where you type in one and it spits out the rest. So it makes Perfect. it a lot easier. Okay, so um, so that's sort of um, the whole visual acuity, central vision piece of it. Then, as was mentioned earlier, peripheral vision, right? And how does that get measured? Um, well, it's the test that we all know and love. The <laughs> um, so it's the central vision that's generally lost with LHON, but um, and that's that's what's measured by Snellen and the ETDRS charts. However, 
With LHO, and it's also important to measure the remaining peripheral vision. That's done with a machine like the one in the photo on the left, where you click a button every time you see a light anywhere in your field of vision. And then on the right, there's an example of the results of a visual field test. And in this particular example, um, it's uh, showing the left eye on the left, and uh, it's marked as OS, because um, to these guys, that means um, the left eye, and then it the right eye. Oculus sinister. Exactly. Because people who are left-handed were considered sinister. And <laughs> OD is ocular dexterous, because people who are right-handed were considered to be better. <laughs> Welcome to Latin. <laughs> So when you see these reports and you see OSOD, now you know what you're seeing and why. Um, and what's up here is actually maybe what many folks who are affected see at their first visit with an ophthalmologist because on the left eye there's a sort of a dense scotoma developing and the right eye is only just beginning uh, to develop a subtle scotoma. You know, so there's this big black spot on the left eye and, and the um, little one on the, on the right. And oftentimes the patient is sort of living their life using both eyes together and the good eye is compensating for the affected eye and it's just annoying and blurring. But then they do this test and it's it's like, oh, now we see what's happening. Um, so before onset, if you do a visual field test and you're an unaffected carrier or a loved one, your visual field test is likely to look like the one I have up on the chart. Um, and uh, you'll be seeing everything in your central and peripheral um, vision. Now, there's a small dot um, on the, in that chart. And the first time I saw one of those for one of my unaffected carrier children, I freaked out because I saw a spot and I thought that meant onset. However, it's a blind spot. It's normal. <laughs> so good to know. Um, and so, um, in the, in the, picture um, that I had before with those the earlier charts where everything was fine it's like on, the charts look fine and then the the person who's looking um, was seeing well but in this particular example if you look really closely and are able to see that photo in the center of the building we've tried to mimic what starts happening um, with LHON there's a super tiny smudge where um, the head of that statue uh, should be and it's really subtle and Anyone new to labors would never notice it. However, as a community that's aware of LHON, if you'd start noticing blurry spots, um, it's good to, to see them early. And but if you you know you might um, you might just hope it'll go away. Um, but then maybe in a week or two, the scotoma gets a little bit larger. And um, Dr. Crunch is sort of pointing at the interesting parts of what's going on. Can you explain in the charts what's happening? So compared to the previous one, if you have a look at the, the image up here, this is the grayscale, which is basically a computer-generated image to show what the computer thinks the patient's going to be able to see. It's designed for glaucoma, so it highlights effects um, from optic nerve damage related to glaucoma. So it's not the best place to look typically for patients with labors. Down below, you've got averages which compare the individual to an age-matched group of controls which the machine has. And it looks to see how sensitive their vision is in different areas relative to the control group. And if it's normal, it's white. If it's abnormal, it ends up being various shades of gray, depending on how likely it is to be abnormal. So a black square means there's a less than a 5% chance that this is abnormal due to chance alone. Um, so here on this image, you can start to see that there are a number of dark black spots in the middle, suggesting that there is a visual deficit. The one next to it is called pattern standard deviation, that's slight derivation of the same thing, um, and it just tries to correct for overall opacity. So if somebody had a cataract, it would end up causing all of this to go black, but this may be completely normal. And then the picture on the right is in an attempt to demonstrate so what's happening to the person, you know, what, what's the person seeing? And they might describe it as, well, you know, if I hold my finger out and at arm's length, it's like a fingertip, or maybe it's a dime-sized blur in perhaps just the one eye. Um, and it might be a nuisance and it might be annoying, but it wouldn't really interfere with life. But a few weeks later, if they go back for another check, 
uh, it might be described as a quarter at arm's length. And the scotoma is getting, in this example, larger. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention about scotomas that folks have talked about is that the images um, that have been showing the scotoma as maybe a blur or a smudge, but um, it actually seems to vary very significantly by the patient and even within the same patient over time. It can often have colorful dots, like I'm showing in this uh, picture on the screen, and the colors can change over time. The, dot ex the dots can be static, they can be moving. Uh, maybe the scotoma looks like a dark cyclone looking from the top down. Um, it, it's not, like people always ask, well, what do, you, what do you see? And it's not the same answer for each patient. And I don't know if there's a why behind it or it just is. Kind of just is, but um, the understanding is that you're getting damage to different pathways at different times. And the other pathways are basically unchecked or have upregulated in, in, to compensate. So you end up seeing various different distortions. Um, so no matter the color or lack of colors, the scotoma can become maybe the size of a fist at arm's length. And at this point, it's no longer a nuisance. It's terrifying, especially if both eyes are affected that way. And then maybe it's two hands at arm's length and then two hands at the end of your nose. Um, and it's kind of easy to wonder if it'll ever stop. With LHON, it generally does stop, leaving some amount of peripheral vision, which is the great news. Um, so that's the peripheral vision. I also want to talk about um, another uh, test that gets encountered as a labor's patient. Um, so while the visual field test measures the function of the optic nerve and how much of the field of vision has been lost, the OCT, optical coherence tomography, measures the health of the optic nerve. Um, unlike the visual field test, which takes time to push that button and is really annoying, um, the OCT is a really simple process as the patient of just having a quick scan done of the eye, and it's measuring the thickness of the optic nerve. Um, so I would prefer to let Dr. Karanja explain what's happening here, please. So an OCT is basically an ultrasound using light. You bounce the light into the eye, and you see how quickly it comes back to the sensor. And by doing that, you can tell how thick certain tissues are, because every plane or every interface between one tissue and another has a slight distortion, and that's going to bounce light back. So by doing that, then you can measure the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is the innermost portion of the retina, which corresponds to the ganglion cells, which output the information to the brain. So by being able to measure that, we have databases that tell us, if you are 50 years old, the retinal nerve fiber layer should be so thick. And so we can compare individuals who have labors to the normal databases to get a sense of how thick or how thin the retinal nerve fiber layer is. In patients who have labors, there's a characteristic pattern which um, involves loss in different areas that moves progressively. And that, again, allows us to help confirm or suggest that there may be something else going on. And looking at this over time as individuals who have been affected for a long period of time also allows us to follow people because the visual field is black, but at the same time, we can still look at the retinal nerve fiber layer. There are some challenges with retinal nerve fiber layer technology in that it has difficulty picking up things that are very thin. So sometimes there's a bit of variability when the nerve gets very thin because it has problems trying to section out those reflections that it's getting back. Um, but it is a good test. It tells us anatomy, but it doesn't tell us anything about function. I don't know if the slide can go back up on the screen, um, but can you, this is what I keep asking you to explain to me when I see, like as the patient, where should the patient or their loved one be looking and what are they looking for? How do you make sense of that? So up here at the top, and each machine has a slightly different printout. At the top of this particular printout, you have something called the average retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And it can be called various different things, total thickness or other things. But that number there, in this case, it's 113. And I'm not sure what the other one is. But it essentially means that is how thick the nerve fiber layer is. The, if it's in green, it suggests that it's normal. If you notice on this side, though, it's in white. And in some cases, it'll be highlighted in purple. And that essentially means it's thicker than what you think it should be. And we know when patients um, are going through the process of conversion, the nerve fiber layer swells, so it gets thicker. And as a result, these numbers can be elevated. 
Now, when they go back down again, that's not necessarily a good thing because it's not only that the swelling's going away, but it also means that some of the fibers are dying. So the idea is to see how this goes, and this perhaps is the optimal time for us to provide a therapy because then maybe we can preserve it. But at the same time, it may also be a bad time to provide therapy because you may end up promoting the death of the cells. So we're kind of stuck in a way. And can you cover the little mountains there on the left? Mm -hmm. Down here? Yeah. Sure. So if you take a look at this line here, it's a ring that goes around the optic nerve where that's the position that it's measured the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber where. It measures it a certain distance, a set distance outside from where the optic nerve center is. So as a result, you can cut this and then unravel this ring and you get this picture down here. And we know that the retinal nerve fiber layer will be thicker on top and at the bottom. And so you get this double humped appearance. And that's what we look at to see whether or not it's in the green area, above the green area, in the yellow area, which suggests that it's abnormal or potentially abnormal, or in the red area where it is definitely abnormal. Down below, it does exactly the same thing as here, but gives us the value that corresponds to each one of the four quadrants, superior, inferior, nasal, and temporal. And at the bottom, it subdivides it into more um, sections of the pie. Thank you. Do you want to go over the piece as well? Sorry? Do you want me to go over the piece as well? Yes. So the other side of the scan is another test, which is very similar to this. But it scans the back of the eye over the macula. And it's looking at the thickness of the ganglion cells in that particular area. So right in the center of the, uh, at the back of the eye, in the macula, you have this little depression where you don't have any ganglion cells. But on either side, there's a little mound of ganglion cells that correspond to all of the photoreceptors that are over here, send their information to those ganglion cells, which send it to the, to the retinal nerve fiber layer. The reason there are no ganglion cells over here is that it would disrupt the light coming back to the photoreceptors. So you want a clear pathway to allow the light to come through to get to the photoreceptors. And the ganglion cells are shifted off to the side. So we're able to measure that, and again, you get a number here. Now this number doesn't swell in the acute phase. So this number show is a more accurate tracker in the acute phase because it it's only shows decline. Thank you. So this is, yeah, this is showing um, the swelling. Yeah. So this is, uh, in the acute phase, you've got swelling in both sides, which is why these peaks have gone above the green area. And over here, you're sowing loss. You're losing some fibers in the ganglion cell layer. And that's highlighted over here with this red patch. Now, the red patch is more nasal than, <coughs> more nasal than temporal uh, in some cases because the machine can sometimes have a little bit more problem with the temporal area where it tries to pick up the information. So hopefully this overview of various tests done by uh, doctors like uh, Dr. Kranja will make your next appointment more productive. Um, we don't have time right now to do Q&A because we have two more amazing um, presentations coming up before the break. Um, so what I'm going to do is ask our next speaker to come up and Dr. Kranja is going to be back at our break at 10.30 and if you have questions for him, we will have a half an hour from 10.30 till 11. And thank you so much, Dr. Kranja. I still think you should come lecture my residence. <laughs> <laughs>